for panel smartphones and social media mixed bag. Oh, the mic. I just let tell everybody to speak into them. Let me start again. <laughs> Let's pretend that didn't happen. My name is Christian Christensen. I'm the moderator for today's panel, uh, Smartphones and Social Media Mixed Bag. Uh, we have three speakers. Uh, the speakers have been allotted roughly 10 minutes. Uh, what I'll do is when we get close to 10, I will just indicate there's like a minute left, so just so you have a rough idea how much time we have. And then uh, we have to be punctual today and finish at uh, 3.45, I've been told by the organizers. So I would ask uh, speakers to stay on time and also at the end for the questions and answers. Uh, we will go in the order uh, which is presented here in the uh, schedule. So our first speaker today is uh, Juliet Storr from Penn State University uh, Beaver, uh, which is in Pittsburgh uh, in the United States, uh, with a paper entitled A Blessing or a Curse. Caribbean journalism upholding truth and democracy in the face of technological innovations. All right, so anyway, I wanted to start with a wonderful question, but I think you've already seen my first slide. However, I'm still going to ask to test your knowledge and see how many of you have been to the Caribbean? Oh, that's more than I expected. Okay, good. So, how many of you know anything about the Caribbean other than a tourist visit? <laughs> All right, that's much better. All right, so a little bit about the Caribbean very quickly. Uh, this map kind of gives you a physical idea of where they are located. And it will come up in my presentation as I talk about uh, what is going on in the region. I'm originally from the Bahamas, and I am also a former journalist. And so I came at this research from the perspective of not only a scholar, but also having been a practitioner. And I teach in the United States, which makes what's going on in the Caribbean very complex and complicated. So, the Caribbean is a mixture of former colonized countries by the former European colonizers like the British, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, and so on. And they left an interesting cultural mix that is still very evident in all of the institutions, including the media. And I'll talk more about that. So, based on the history of the countries, as well as the size of the populations. These are very small countries or microstates in the English-speaking Caribbean, which is where my research is focused first. You will find that the largest English-speaking Caribbean country is Jamaica with 2.8 million people, followed by Trinidad and Tobago with about 1.3 million people. And in between the two of them, you have countries as small as Anguilla with about 40,000 people, uh, which makes it very interesting in terms of what's going on with media, media evolution in terms of the ecosystems that are now emerging based on changes in technology, but also changes that came about through the changes in the marketplace. Um, because of their colonial history, which plays a significant role in media ownership, uh, you will find that most of these media markets now have what we call a mixed or hybrid market. Uh, they still have the state that plays a significant role in terms of uh, regulator, and in some cases, the state still owns media. And so public and private media are in the current marketplace, in some cases, existing in very competitive markets post-1990s. And I say post-1990s because that's when most of the changes started to happen. And so over the last almost 20 years now, as we're at the end or coming towards the end of the second decade of the 21st century, you are seeing in the countries very competitive media markets with a lot of changes taking place, particularly for journalism, uh, led by market reforms and also technology. And so I wanted to raise the question about Caribbean journalism and whether or not journalism uh, or journalists 
uh, upholding truth and democracy in the face of all of these changes, particularly technological innovations. And so I have spent the last about 15 years, uh, but the research really dates from 20, 2007 to about 2017, so about 10 years, talking to media practitioners, talking to media owners, talking to uh, civil mem uh, members of civil society about these changes and talking to uh, others who are scholars about the changes that are going on in the Caribbean. I've done a lot of field work and so I've spent those years interviewing. So what, has, what is the market, what does it look like? And so this is the current media environment and I think most of the presenters, presenters who have talked earlier have talked about this in some way uh, in terms of what is in these societies. And so basically the journalists who are at the center, uh, so you have news filtering, fact checking, commentary and analysis. And so in this kind of configuration you have uh, individual bloggers or communities um, of individuals who are also adding to the information cycle and grassroots reporting. And so in this new environment, this is how journalism is being practiced in all of the countries that I looked at. So I looked at six countries in the English-speaking Caribbean, uh, beginning with Jamaica because it has the largest and followed by Trinidad. One, because Jamaica is closer to North America and Trinidad is further, it's in the southern end of the archipelago. And then the Bahamas, because it is the closest English speaking to the United States and so and also where I'm originally from. And also uh, in this six countries, uh, Grenada and also Gren Grenada, uh, Barbados, and Belize. So of course all of these concerns are there in terms of what's going on globally, uh, the practice of verification, objectivity and professionalism. Uh, we have the same kind of discourse that has emerged in the United States which is very close to the Caribbean in terms of the uncertainty that of the future of journalism and so guess over the last three decades, close to three decades now, we've moved that discourse from talking about the death of journalism to the uncertainty of journalism to where we are today, talking about the relevance of journalism. And so these questions have emerged in the English-speaking Caribbean in terms of journalism's future, and journalists have been trying to un understand how to practice in the changed environment. And so digital technologies, of course, like the smartphone, which is, everywhere in the region and so there's 100% smartphone uh, dispersion throughout the entire, all of the countries that I looked at. And so of course the questions of how do you operate in a hyper-local information environment becomes a challenge in day-to-day -day practice and so a lot of the questions concerning the use of social media, uh, the internet, and whether it is a positive or a negative in terms of how information is circulated, the kinds of information that is circulated, and what impact it has on democratic uh, institutions, uh, democracy in general. And so in this environment in the Caribbean, there are these questions. Uh, so these are the countries, as I noted uh, earlier in the study, uh, how the information, I looked at uh, themes that emerge from this data set and of course I can't present all of it to you. And so these are some of the themes that I looked at in this paper that I'm presenting here. And so I've talked about one of them which is the competitive media markets to give you a sense of how competitive they are in terms of, uh, I would give you in the last 10 years you've gone from one main state broadcaster uh, to almost in some cases for Trinidad in, in particular, you have about roughly 75 private radio and television stations and one state broadcaster. And the state broadcaster is now 
literally this year, they just changed their model again. So they've gone from state broadcasting to public service broadcasting, back to state broadcasting maybe. Uh, literally the company, the first company failed and, and they created a new one. And when I say they, I'm talking about the governments. So you have various relationships in public service broadcasting, still run by the state, and so you have majority, minority relationships where governments continue to own all of the state broadcasting, and sh you have some shared, ooh, two. All right, I told him I'm from the Caribbean, and if you know anything about us, <laughs> we talk a lot. However, and he asked me what that mean. I told him you were going to find out in a few minutes, so I guess he found out. Anyway, so I have two minutes. All right, so you, you fine. Okay, good. So, <laughs> all right, and I'm just warming up. Anyway, so you can see these are the themes that emerge. We can talk more about them. Uh, very competitive markets, uh, fragmented uh, information environments, accelerated, accelerated um, technological changes, professionalism and credibility, uh, adversarial relationships with political elites, which is very fascinating, and uh, relevance of journalism. I decided to only look at, for this presentation, and if we have time, the fragmented information environments. And basically, uh, we've gone from mass audiences to bits and pieces, controlled by a lot of dissemination being controlled by citizens who are disseminating. What's up is the most popular social media. And uh, a lot of the changes that are going on are disrupting, of course, the institutions, public institutions, politics in particular. Uh, there was a, someone from Chile who presented earlier in a panel who talked about uh, the practitioners, uh, so the, what's going on in, in the newsrooms. And so it, it was fascinating as I listened to him, uh, I could almost just see the same thing uh, in terms of looking at a journalist telling me in the Caribbean that we have to deal with the politicians on a day-to-day -day basis. And so when I can talk to them using WhatsApp 24 seven, and they do send information sometimes, it's when they're drunk after something has come out and they want to respond, but the journalist isn't able to actually respond because they can't use us as a source, WhatsApp as a source. However, all of the journalists are using WhatsApp and so that makes it quite interesting. In terms of uh, one of the Trinidadian journalists, Tracy Lewis talked about uh, what's going on in the prospect for the media industry as we know it today. Uh, don't posture well, local newsroom staff have shrunk and fiscal constraints uh, implemented. We need to borrow a barometer for from the social media where eyeballs congregate to consume content, relevance matters most to infiltrate the individual virtual worlds we now all inhabit via our ubiquitous mobile devices. Um, a part of this, how the US makes it complicated in the fragmented uh, environments that they find themselves in, Proximity matters, and so, for example, whenever there's a disaster, so this year, Trinidad had an earthquake. And so, the American media were broadcasting about the results of the earthquake, as well as the year before when the hurricanes came through, and their coverage is often circulated in the Caribbean, both through uh, cable, uh, also through satellite, and now social media and the internet. And so the U.S. coverage of those natural disasters overshadowed the local media coverage, and as a result, you had all of the inaccuracies from the U.S. media mixing with local inaccuracies, which made for a very interesting um, combination of fake news from official uh, sources like U.S. media organizations like NBC, Fox, uh, CNN, and so on. And so uh, Caribbean journalists found themselves combating that information, trying to get accurate information about, particularly during disasters like hurricane and also earthquake. And so um, the president of the Media Institute in, in the Caribbean, which was just founded about 2015, talks about how that impacts the credibility of local news coverage and how it makes it challenging for journalists and what they have to do. Uh, she also talks about 
some of the changes that journalists need to, in terms of the innovative changes that need to be implemented. The newsrooms still operate with uh, the about 20 years uh, ago in terms of how newsrooms operate, and those haven't changed, but journalists themselves are using new technology, uh, mostly social media, but the newsroom technology is still very outdated, and the managers, uh, in terms of the practice of media, uh, in terms of uh, journalism, you find a lot of them are still looking at how journalists or journalism was practiced about 10 to 15 years ago. And so some of those complaints uh, were very evident in the conversations I had with the uh, journalists. And so very quickly, I'll give you an overview of the findings. I talked about the hyperlocal information cultural and how um, cultures, how challenging the assumptions of professionalism is, the rising anxiety about the future practice in the profession, growing concern for understanding of the functions of journalism, uh, attacks on the truth. And so the ultimate question is how well are journalists uh, protecting and upholding um, democracy and principles of democracy in this environment? And it's mixed. You have uh, a combination of, yes, we are providing credible information. We are still seen as the last checkpoint on the uh, the need for, or in terms of verifying whether information is accurate. Um, however, because the high usage of social media is very much present and very competitive, it makes it very challenging for them to actually uphold the truth. And also when you throw, uh, put into this mix the political atmosphere, these are small microstates, centralized governments, and so the information, uh, control of information is still very much a part of the um, environment, particularly uh, public information, which even though there are laws for practice or in practice, you would find that a lot of journalists don't have access to public information. Uh, I don't have time to actually give you more about this um, large body of work, and so I hope in the question and answer period we get to talk about some of it. All right, thank you. So I can just start by presenting myself. My name is uh, Thomas. Uh, I work as a researcher at the university in Bergen. I used to work as a journalist for a while. So now, then I took a PhD in offshore safety, as you do, and then started to re do research on news and particularly on social media. Uh, where is, uh, how do you get the, yeah. Um, uh, so I, this is part of a larger project where I try to look at um, news reading on social media, news production on social media, news dissemination on social media. Uh, so right now I'm going to present some research on how Norwegian journalists use social media to, as a source for news, uh, how they monitor uh, Facebook and Twitter and use that material to create new stories. So it's going to be um, so, sort of snapshots of um, the kind of uh, journalism they produce uh, with basis in uh, social media posts made by or posted by um, ordinary people. It's a bit ambiguous term, but in this context, I, I refer to ordinary people as people who are not celebrities or media personalities or uh, hold any position where uh, media exposure is expected. Uh, so I don't include the latest tweets of Donald Trump or the Instagram uploads of uh, Kardashians, because there are a lot of them in the news stories as well. And also uh, only included stories where the main part uh, of the content is generated from social media, not where um, there's, there's a general media report and there are some quotes from social media there as well. Um, so what I found uh, is that um, in general, uh, when they find a Facebook post and turn a news story out of it, they usually reproduce the main content 
uh, of the social media posts and an interview with the person who posted it uh, and a private photo of the person. Uh, only on a few occasions do they elaborate on the topic any further and do any more work on it. So it's mainly a very cheap and fast uh, form of journalism. Uh, and Facebook is the preferred medium, which is not um, very surprising because it's the most popular social medium in Norway. Uh, and the, the stories from Instagram were mainly uh, very short articles about uh, some person who has 40,000 followers on Instagram, and that was the basic, basics of the story that uh, someone has a lot of followers. And national newspapers use social media as a source a lot more than local newspapers, um, mainly because I think that they can choose from all over the country. The local newspapers needs local proximity for a case to be interesting for them. But it also refers to that the national news organizations uh, have more resources and monitor uh, social media more actively than lo local newspapers do. Um, and th the topics uh, covered in the articles uh, had some great variations. There were uh, a lot of serious topics like unemployment, uh, health care, elderly care, uh, nutrition in, in nursery homes, uh, a lot of stories about politics. Uh, bullying, uh, also, but also lifestyle and a lot of humorous uh, stories. But in general, a wide variety of, of, uh, of topics, as you can see. And, and uh, uh, the one category was uh, amusing customer complaints. Um, uh, these stories were um, on consumer action would typically be focused on a social media post where a user complained about something. And the complaint would often be directed against a commercial company uh, or a transport service or a public office, the normal day-to-day you know, -day frustrations about something trivial. And they were often quite entertaining um, and quite amusing uh, in the way they were written. Uh, at the, the period of the data collection, there were a lot of stories about beer uh, and the reason for that is um, uh, one of the major food chains in Norway. We're going to change their policy so they will cut out a lot of breweries from their uh, from their stores. Uh, so, uh, and this caused a social media uproar uh, from people complaining that their local beer brand wouldn't be available in this uh, uh, in the stores anymore. So. But there were also uh, very serious issues, um, like in the healthcare topics. Uh, one of the subtopics there was elderly care. Uh, and this is an article based on a social media post where a man posted a picture of his dad. Uh, his dad was living home alone and had just tripped and sustained very visible injuries. Um, and he posted this on, on Facebook in, a, in an attempt to get his father uh, admitted to a nursing home. Um, uh, so the Facebook post was a plea for this to happen. Uh, and this is one of the uh, stories where they actually took it a bit further and interviewed a lot of politicians and uh, gave some more background for why he, he wasn't able to, why they wouldn't give him uh, a place in a nursing home. Uh, so people go to Facebook with both their trivial and very serious issues. Uh, one of the other categories is, is traffic. Um, uh, dash cams and GoPros produce a lot of uh, dramatic pictures, as you probably have seen. Um, a lot of uh, dramatic videos um, about dangerous or irritating behavior in traffic. Uh, and, this, um, and there's also a war between cars and cyclists in Norway. I guess you have that in other countries as well. Uh, so this is from a, a dash cam of a bus driver. He, he um, is very angry about the cyclist in front of him. And you see the, you can't really see it, but the, the cyclist is flipping him off in the last picture there. Um, the, uh, so he posted this video on Facebook and complained that the cyclist would slow him down and all that. And in all these cases, there 
there is uh, a lot of anger in the comments section. Uh, they, they produce a lot of engagement uh, and a lot of angry comments about uh, the cyclists. They had to... Uh, the journalists were actually able to find out who he was, but they couldn't uh, write his name. And they uh, assumed it would be too dangerous for him, um, that he would get a, a lot of threats if they, if they interviewed him directly. Um, of course, in the humor section, there was a lot of quite entertaining uh, cases. This is part of the, the humorous war between the north and the south parts of Norway. Uh, this is from springtime, when there is uh, usually a lot of stories about the nice weather in Oslo. Um, so the, this person from, from way up north someplace uh, posted his photo of his springtime in, uh, in the north. So he says, you don't, have, you don't need nice weather uh, to be comfortable here, up here. Um, and also, um, uh, job applications is one of the categories where people use social media to post pictures of themselves and um, uh, write about their difficulties getting a job. But um, you see that um, the news story usually reproduces the main content of the social media posts and an interview with the person and a private photo of the person. Uh, only on a few occasions do they spend more resources on the case, like using a professional photographer, using additional resources, doing anything to elaborate the topic. Um, and so in most cases, they use the social media posts uh, and the, an interview as the main source. Sometimes it was only the social media post. But only about 16% of the articles were there any additional uh, sources than this. Uh, and the case is usually focused mainly on the virality in the headline uh, and in the lead paragraphs, as you can see here, that is this job application is taught off of Facebook, which means it goes viral uh, in, in the region. Uh, so most of the cases had, like, the virality was the main point for writing about this case. Um, uh, and so here's a typical uh, example of one of the cases this again uh, Facebook is uh, <laughs> is in the headline and uh, a screenshot from the social media posts uh, and the rest of the article is mainly a replica of the social media posts and they all almost always use private photos uh, only on a few occasions do they um, use professional photos so, the social media posts here represent, or they resemble uh, letters to the editor, uh, where whenever someone is happy about something, or displeased about something, or has a complaint about something, or needs help about something, they don't write letters to the editors anymore, they go to Facebook instead, uh, and write about their uh, story there. So. Um, so there is a great potential for journalists here to do more about it. There was one case which I was not allowed to use. Uh, I have it anonymized in my, my uh, material, but it was about a toddler who nearly died. Uh, he lived also in a very rural area of Norway and the local hospital had been closed down. So it was a very long way to get him to any emergency unit and he nearly died because of that. Uh, and that actually became a big story in Norway involving uh, some of the major politicians and the major media. But since this was a toddler, I needed to get permission um, from his parents uh, to use it as a case in my research. And so I contacted them and they said, like, what kind of science is this? Uh, so, <laughs> so that's what you get when you study social media. <laughs> but for me, it's just it's a lot of material for me to analyze. So this, uh, having great fun with this. and. Um, I also think uh, there is a much greater potential uh, for journalists there to find more material because if you, if you want contact with the public, but this is where, well, not everyone are here, but a lot of people are here and they write about 
uh, about their trivial frustrations and about their major frustrations uh, and uh, a lot of humorous content, but also a lot of serious issues that they, they uh, write about and that uh, uh, goes viral in a, uh, in a survey related to this when I looked at which social media posts go viral in Norway. Uh, there were no uh, cute kitties or something like that. There were only serious issues and humorous issues. A serious issues concerning unemployment, uh, health benefits, health care, uh, traffic safety. So it was a lot of, uh, lot of good material there. And it was written like very directly and personal, which is often what you want when you make news. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Marius Goudonis, and uh, uh, I was born in England, lived many years in France. Now I'm based in Poland. So when people ask me about my nationality, I always reply truthfully that I'm nomadic. Um, so the question is, has the far right, and by the way, I am a PhD candidate, and I, um, my, my uh, specialization is the sociology of Holocaust, I mean, Holocaust and genocide denial. Anyway, the title for this presentation, Has the Far Right Colonized Social Media? I ask this question because there are a lot of good papers, scientific and popular, that describe in detail uh, how the far right has skillfully used uh, social media and, um, and has done it to, to great effectiveness. Um, and they go into content analysis and they count the tweets and they, uh, and they do a lot of res good research on that. The only problem with this research, that although it, a lot of it is very much systematic and good quality, uh, they invariably focus just on that hate speech. So they focus on the denial itself, but they do not uh, weigh it up with the counter message. And of course there are organizations and so on that also oppose uh, right-wing ideology and they give a counter message. So here what I want to do is to take a very specific historical massacre that took place uh, in 1941 in Poland uh, and compare the videos on YouTube uh, which deny this massacre uh, and I'll explain in a second what I mean by the word denial, and to compare them with videos that acknowledge this uh, massacre. Um, just uh, to remind you that uh, I'll be focusing on the Polish case, but of course the Polish case is very much uh, part of a, a larger movement where the far right if it doesn't directly espouse Holocaust denial or other forms of genocide denial, uh, the far right certainly tolerates it. Uh, the, the best two examples I could come up with is, of course, Marine Le Pen, who uh, tried to distance her party, and remember her party has even changed name now to Rassemblement National. Um, even she, while she distances her party from explicit overt anti-Semitism, she still uh, says that I don't think France is responsible for Veldif, the uh, deportation of Jews by the Vichy uh, administration. Uh, Nick Griffin from the British National Party, former leader of that party, uh, was very much 
involved in uh, disseminating uh, Holocaust denial literature. So what I say to you, of course, is the Polish case, but uh, it certainly isn't unique. Uh, first of all, what do I mean by denial? Uh, I'm not just talking about uh, explicit negation, okay? I'm not just saying that denial is when you deny that the actual event took place. That is just one form of denial. Uh, Stanley Cohen gives three very useful uh, types. He talks about literal denial, which is that uh, negation, then he talks about interpretive denial, where you will accept the bare facts, but you try to trivialize it or minimize it or try to put it in another context, which, uh, which may um, have an effect on how we look at the perpetrators. And then he gives a third uh, type of denial, which is uh, implicatory denial, where you neither deny the facts nor the interpretation, but you deny the ethical consequences. And so a good example of that would be, well, I accept everything that happened during the war and so on, and all the interpretations, but it doesn't concern me. Because I'm a different generation, it doesn't concern me. That would be an uh, implicatory denial. So, but. I'm taking a very broad denial, uh, meaning of denial here, so it's not only the negation of the fact. Uh, the particular case study is the Yedvabne massacre, uh, from the, which took place on the 10th of July 1941. Now, this, uh, what happened here was that during the... Uh, First, the, the Eastern Poland was occupied, of course, by the Soviet uh, power, and then uh, when Germany uh, uh, attacked the Soviet Union, uh, it reoccupied Eastern Poland, so this part of Poland would have uh, experienced two totalitarian regimes. Uh, and two weeks after that German occupation, in several cities in eastern Poland, uh, we have a very atypical situation uh, regarding the Holocaust, that it is the local uh, Catholic population which uh, massacres many of its Jewish neighbors. And one particular case uh, is the case of Yedwabne, where uh, about 300, over 300 uh, Jews, most of the uh, Jews living in that community at the time were herded into a barn and burnt alive. Now, 2001, uh, Polish sociologist Jan Gross publishes a book called Neighbours, Sąsiedzi, detailing the massacre. It was a huge, huge shock in Poland, uh, really because uh, there was a myth of absolute Polish innocence and heroism. Um, and here, uh, for the first time to a mass audience, of course historians knew about such atypical cases, but to a mass audience this was an enormous shock. And it caused a huge debate lasting for about two years. It culminated in the Instant Institute of National Memory confirming the key points in, in Gross's original text and the president of Poland apologizes for the crime uh, at the 60th anniversary commemoration. So, what I did is I used uh, a piece of software um, which uh, uses the YouTube API, Webometric Analyst, it's called, Webometric Analyst. Uh, just you can type in, it's, you can use it for all sorts of social media. You type in your keyword and it comes up with all the titles, the videos and various metadata. So I, uh, when I uh, typed in the term Yedwabne, I get over 500 videos which mention this term in the description or in the metadata. Half of them were not connected with the massacre at all. So when you filter out all those which were irrelevant, you get about 216. 
216 videos from 2007 to 2018. Uh, and as you can see by year, uh, remember YouTube was founded in 2005, the first videos come out in 2007, you can see there is a rise uh, and rather than this type of genocide denial uh, decreasing with time, it's actually increasing with time. But at the moment, what you see here are videos both denialist and acknowledging the crime. Um, I'm, I have here a couple of uh, videos that I wanted to show you as an example, but I'll just show you one, if I may. And this one I chose specifically because it happens to be uh, in English. The, just, it's just the, uh, the subtitles are in English. And this is a typical example of a denialist uh, video. So here, if we can listen to this. So what you see in this narrative is that it very much focuses on the ethnic national group, the Polish ethnic group, the Catholic group, and that they were the real victims here, not the Jews. Um, and that is what we see again and again in denialist videos. Now, we won't look at ambiguity. Well, ambiguity is, a, is an interesting case. What I've done, I had to code each video whether it's denialist or acknowledging, uh, sometimes you get a contradictory message. This is very typical in YouTube videos where you can have the content going in one direction, but the frame, the title or the description goes in another direction. So uh, you have to be very careful because then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the overall message? Is it denialist or is it acknowledging? If the title uh, suggests there is a doubt with the so-called two minutes, oh dear. Uh, if the if the if the title suggests that there is uh, a doubt with the so-called official narrative, then you are framed to think of it in a certain way. But any anywhere where there was a doubt, I will I I clo I I simply put it into another the other section where there's ambiguity. So, out of the 216 videos, and remember, this is the total population of videos, this is not a sample, um, we see a huge majority of 64% which deny the Polish Catholic involvement in the crime. Uh, only 15% would acknowledge with 21% I couldn't uh, say for definite which way it goes. However, this is the full population and perhaps it is misleading because of course some videos only have 20 views and others have 20,000 views. So let's look at a top 20 and see if the results are different. We'll just ignore the video hours for, for, for a second here. So, top 20 Yedwabne videos based on view count, okay, the popularity. We have an even greater majority, 85%, that deny the Polish involvement in this particular crime. What about the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm? Well, let's, according to the YouTube algorithm, if you type in Yedwabne, 80% will still be denialist. In fact, the only video which acknowledges the crime as the historical records show comes about 19th position. Uh, so it's clearly all denialist here. Uh, very briefly, because I only got a, a minute left, I think, um, regarding uh, the Polish diaspora, I was interested to see whether 
some, whether there is an input in these videos from people, Poles living abroad. A uh, lot of good scientific studies show that ethnic identity in diasporas often is a bit more nationalistic uh, regarding portrayal of national history. But, as you can see, 98% of all the videos that deny uh, the Polish involvement originate in Poland, so there's no diaspora foreign input. However, the videos that acknowledge the crime, 40% come from abroad. And the final slide here is about viewer engagement. Now, there are many ways to uh, measure viewer engagement. And what I've done is I've taken the likes, dislikes and comments divided by the views per thousand. So here we have on this column uh, the ratios for the videos that acknowledge the crime and the ratio for the top 10 videos that deny the crime. And we see much greater uh, viewer engagement regarding videos that acknowledge the crime rather than those that deny the crime. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe somebody can give me a suggestion. The key statistic, though, I would like to highlight to you, which I found very interesting and which is confirmed by studies on this subject, is this one here. This is the, the dislikes, the ratio showing the dislikes for uh, the videos that acknowledge the crime. What this statistic suggests that a lot of people, nationalists, will actively search out the videos that acknowledge the crime in order to put in comments, negative comments. And what, we, and what this, these ratios suggest also, that those who acknowledge the crime tend to avoid videos that are nationalistic. I think I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you to our speakers for staying on time. We have a nice about, uh, I'd say, about 20, 25 minutes left for, for questions and answers. So I, I just suggest we open up the floor immediately, and, and I don't take any more time. So questions? I'll leave. Thank you, okay. uh, thank you Marius. I, I'm Walid al from Sadatar University in Stockholm. One question I had in mind about the, when you mentioned the st st statistical analysis, is I, I'm missing the number of individual accounts, whether they are the same group of people who are publishing these videos, or is it that they have, uh, each individual video is coming from a different person? Because this might, might be a, a, an indicator of a coordinated uh, propaganda attempt. The other question is, have you no witnessed, uh, noticed any variance between the likes? Are they similar in magnitude in terms of you have the the uh, views, I believe, or likes per 1,000? But did you find some videos having much more because they may end up skewing the overall uh, sta uh, st um, uh, mean value for the whole set? Okay, thank you. A few qu quantitative questions. I think this works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, regarding uh, the leaders, that's a very good question because we know that in social media you often have a group of extremely active people, entrepreneurs of the, of the nationalist or whatever ideology it is. Uh, and they will often be the ones who um, statistically over-represent a certain view by commenting, by uh, producing lots of videos. However, in this case, I noticed that the same uploader uploaded five videos on this subject. It's not so much. And then there's some that uploaded four, three. So in fact, no, uh, there wasn't a, a group that, that uh, really changed the, the, the average uh, because, of, uh, because of their uh, excessive engagement uh, with this uh, story. Uh, regarding um, the second question was about the... Outliers, I mean videos that 
oh yes, uh, could, could there be, um, I have to do more uh, to check whether the, a, a single result could have changed this, the mean. Uh, at, at this stage, I couldn't give you an answer on that. There. Thank you very much. They were all three very fascinating. And, I, and there was one question, I guess, that all three of them made me think about. Um, and that is uh, the thoughts you might have over the degree to which these media are amplifying versus reflecting issues. And so um, my understanding of the Caribbean is there have actually been some, you know, quite a few uh, political uh, surprises in the past few in the in the democracies in the past few years uh, in the region ha is that because of underlying things changing or what is the contribution of the amplification by new media forms and I guess the uh, Norwegian social media examples I, I you might even have it in your data right which is you said there are all these stories which in a way didn't used to make it um, you know, stories about uh, consumer complaints or traffic. Of course, there were stories about like the, the, those sorts of stories in the popular press. Has their proportion, has the, has the mix of coverage changed? And would that be an indicator of an amplifying mechanism for new types of content? And I, I guess it's very obvious in your case, is this an amplifier uh, or is this a reflector of, you know, you have communities who have these beliefs and they're putting them out there? Or is it actually, uh, to what extent can we actually disentangle the degree to which this is uh, not only putting some beliefs out there, but increasing their prevalence? In the Caribbean, I would say that it's mixed. You have amplification going on. Uh, because the environments have changed and you have more freedom to express your opinions in various venues. M most people are choosing social media. And culturally, this has always happened, but not because people weren't free to talk, but they didn't have social media in which to talk as quickly. Uh, about politics, uh, politicians, uh, this new environment that they find themselves in in terms of disrupting the political traditions of a centralized government. Uh, so what used to happen in maybe social environments, smaller spaces, social get-togethers, uh, you're now seeing happening more quickly through social media, and so there's a, a ramping up, so to speak, of what might seem like more discontent. Uh, but the discontent has, I think, made itself more prevalent, not just in the Caribbean, but globally, because people have access to technology. And so there is a kind of a mix of what is actually happening in the market phase. There's amplification, but at the same time, uh, people have been, there has been growing discontent with the various kinds of governments post-1990. Uh, uh, in my material, there is um, an amplification of some topics, uh, like there is, um, uh, a lot of uh, stories about politics, but nothing about foreign politics, only about uh, local and national politics. Uh, there's very little about accidents, which is a big topic in, uh, in journalism uh, in general. Uh, there was almost nothing about sports, which surprised me a little bit because sports is hugely popular. But I guess the, the, the sports audience, they uh, they get their fair share anyway, so they don't feel the need to amplify it. Uh, and of course, there are uh, some uh, groups on the on, on the, the far right who are actively trying to amplify uh, stories about uh, immigration. Uh, and I have um, I'm also looking at uh, the news articles that are uh, being most shared 
on social media. And the, the alternative news media in Norway, there are mainly three webs, websites that are very active. Um, they are very small, but they have, uh, uh, they have a, uh, a strategy uh, of visibility in social media, and, and it is working uh, when it comes to share numbers in social media. They are almost competing with the largest media organizations in Norway. Uh, three points for your question. First of all, um, very few vlogs, very few personal comments in the videos that I uh, found out of the 216. Maybe five or six, which is surprising. A lot of very slick media productions. Um, not the one that I showed you, but I was surprised how many there they were. So there's a bit. There's quite a lot of institutionalization of these YouTube media channels on the Polish right, far right, or populist right. The second point is, uh, it, my, my data shows it is very clear amplification. Yes, there is a lot of nationalism in Poland. There's a lot of Holocaust denial, not the same type of David Irving Holocaust denial, but denial of Polish participation in certain crimes but not 80% of people. Uh, the opinion polls show about 40% 40, 40 uh, that uh, deny, 40% that uh, acknowledge, and then 20% who don't have an opinion. It changes from year to year. But so there is a clear amplification. But the third point, why is there such an amplification? Well, first of all, in Poland, there's very big distrust of institutions, I think much greater than in other countries, because of the communist past. Remember, during the communist period, there was a lot of alternative media from the underground, from solidarity. They were the alternative media, and they were actually giving true accounts of the political system. The trouble is that the same, uh, there's a, people, a lot of people still distrust what they see as official media. And the alternative media now is not telling the truth, but is per purveying Holocaust denial. Uh, so we cannot understand the Polish case without looking at the heritage of the communist system. Actually, since we have a, a lull here in the questions, I have, I have a question of my own, and that's about primarily about political economy here, uh, because it seems to me in, in the case of the news here, we have two examples of the use of technology that will probably lower costs, and in the case of the Caribbean, I'm imagining small population, these are crucial questions in terms of maintaining local journalism. It's, it's faced by small communities in Scandinavia, for example, as well. Small towns don't have a lot of uh, people willing to pay for product anymore. They're getting their news online. Uh, in the case of Norway, I mean, you've got the user-generated content argument here that you've got a sort of an unlimited supply of free stories being pumped into the media, which then sort of jump onto these in the sort of guise of speaking for the average citizen, right? Here's a sort of average citizen in this part of, he's having a terrible problem with the local healthcare system. Uh, he can't get coverage or whatever the story might be. And so basically in, in the absence of actual reporting, uh, you let sort of people send in their stories. And of course it, I mean, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here, but for example, saying like, well, we are covering it. It just happens that we didn't actually do it ourselves. Someone else did it. And so I'm, I mean, this doesn't, and, and I guess political economy might come in the argument of YouTube's algorithms, that that's one of the reasons why you're seeing these kinds of stories with that massive number of 80%. That's because these are the kinds of things that drive traffic. I mean, if you took racism away, Twitter would drop dead tomorrow, right? Um, and if you took away the far, I mean, these are real drivers of a huge volume of the user-generated content on social media. Um, so I guess my question here is, if, if we start, for example, with the journalism in the Caribbean, I mean, to what extent, I mean, what is the situation at the moment in terms of ownership and journalism, and I mean, how sustainable is this kind of local journalism in these, in these islands? If we forget about Jamaica and look at some of the smaller ones, that's the first question, how sustainable is it? And the second one is, are we seeing, like, micro power clusters in this region that are sort of sucking up? Because what's happening in Sweden is, 
small local newspapers are being increasingly bought up by large conglomerates. It's what we saw in the United States when we deregulated local media markets. You just saw huge companies just vacuum clean up all the small papers and turn them into basically cookie cutter newspapers. Is that the same thing that we're seeing in Caribbean? So I'll address the last part first. Part of the competitive market, which I didn't have time to go into, is this trend where conglomeration has become very popular over the past 10 years. You have very large, for the small size countries, very large conglomerates that have taken control of the market. However, they all, according to what they are releasing, are surviving and so it seems to be sustainable. So the market in terms of conglomeration, they are not just increasing the amount or the number of media institutions or organizations that they own, but they are also going outside. So you're seeing a diversification in their portfolios and they're not just media companies anymore. And so the same kind of trend that you saw in the US is now very prominent in the region. And so in terms of looking at some of the other issues where you're seeing are there challenges? So in the online environment or the digital environment, you are seeing new kinds of models emerge. They're sustainable because these are small markets and you only, well, they are requiring not a significant in terms of the amount of users to support them. So they do have advertisers who are advertising on them because some of them have their own agenda. Some of those agendas are political and so they're causing some disruption in terms of uh, getting people to believe the, the content, the information that they're disseminating. And, so that's another m new trend, the online new media that has emerged. And so y they are growing in terms of their popularity. Uh, but you also have uh, just regular citizens who are doing journalism and disseminating information uh, for their own purposes. Some of them have a personal agenda, some of them don't. What is surprising out of my research in the small markets is that the media conglomerates or uh, media organizations have not had the same in terms of the decrease in the amount of private media has not occurred. As a matter of fact, there has been an increase in the growing amount of mostly broadcast, uh, which was part of the 1990s trend, which is when I responded earlier by saying that you had opportunities to voice your discontent, and a lot of that came out after privatization, uh, liberalization in the 1990s, and so uh, you have a very competitive market with a lot of radio stations, private radio stations, who are creating a different kind of disruption or have created a different kind of disruption. Uh, you also have internet and social media and you have the new kinds of media organizations that are emerging out of this. You also have state-run media and you have uh, foreign media, most of that coming from the United States, but also some from the um, European Pharmacom media conglomerates uh, who are still in the market. And so all of them compete for very uh, interesting small size audiences, but it works. Uh, the newspapers, are, particularly the dominant newspapers are still surviving. Uh, Jamaica, Trinidad, uh, Trinidad in particular is a very special case uh, because newspapers have been growing in terms of their amount of readership um, until the last two years where they have reported some decrease in readership but not significant, so their readership has gone up. So a uh, very complex kind of complicated environments, very small, uh, but at the same time um, a lot of challenges. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Ah, uh, yes. 
<laughs> and the second go on the Caribbean, because I, you, you, you have, I, I guess what, I, I guess I, I just want to, this pure information in a sense. I had an impression that the Caribbean was also seeing something of the populist wave that we've seen everywhere. Uh, Costa Rica, possibly not Caribbean, but the last elections, there was, a, you know, a com an extraordinary anti uh, extraordinary, uh, n completely new, very large-scale support triggered by an anti-gay movement coming out of the evangelical churches and, as far as I understand it, impossible without a social media spreading. And am I right that it's Barbados that had an election that surprised everyone by going, you know, 100% to the opposition in the parliament, something that never happened before, sort of polarization which we'd not seen anywhere before. Uh, are you, n n what you've said has been a kind of, well, you know, these are, the, here are some long trends, and yet we get, uh, you know, my, I don't, I don't follow the region, but I get the impression of these really quite uh, uh, large-scale changes that are happening in the politics. Are you not relating those to the, are those in isolated cases, are they unrelated to this transformation in media? So that's not in isolation. They are happening, but, and, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, the, the long history in terms of the institutional structures, government control is still very evident. And so yes, you are seeing some populist movement, Trinidad, Barbados had the example, Trinidad uh, last year, and then the elections in Grenada, also you saw some changes. But overall, the changes haven't impacted on the macro level as much. You're seeing the populist movements, but a lot of it is being done by mostly the young millennials. And so what they're going up against are the institutional approach in terms of the church, politics, and other social institutions. And so you're seeing a lot of challenge, you're seeing some populist movement, but in terms of the media's role and, and coverage, and I didn't have a time to get to some of the other respondents who actually talked about this, uh, you aren't seeing the media cover from that perspective because uh, very small societies and the media is usually controlled by the people who have relationships with the politicians. So either they are owned by the politicians or their relatives, or they have some relationship with the government or the opposition. And so it is challenging to see the media cover those, and they've been criticized for that uh, significantly for not having the kind of uh, openness and uh, not being as, and some of them have been accused of being very biased and, and the way that they cover uh, a lot of the populist movements uh, coming out of uh, the movements for change in terms of uh, gay rights and uh, other areas, uh, sexual harassment, uh, gender equality. So a lot of the social issues are not getting the kind of coverage that they should have gotten, uh, particularly from the media. And so a lot of people have been criticizing what the media's role has been in helping democracy, uh, democracy, um, democracy and pushing these issues so that they become uh, more equitable in terms of egalitarian societies, which the, that is the current movement, so yes. Well, if we don't have any further questions, I'd like to uh, thank our panel members for participating for a very uh, interesting conversation. Thank you very much. Do we have a coffee break or what is the...